Okay. It's like one of his favorite movies. So, so we kind of like built a a show around that, which was like to watch movies with our friends. Yeah. Um, and uh, just an excuse to hang out, uh, talk about a movie. So the concept is that we bring people on. They uh, they bring us a movie that they love, um, your desert island movie or your you know something that you just want to share, and so it's a great excuse to just hang out with people we want to hang out with mm-hmm. and talk about movies for a mm-hmm. while. So it's nothing nothing serious. How long have you been doing that podcast? Um, <laughs> it's funny because we we recorded maybe our first two in like December of twenty two. And then we wanted to kind of bank a few episodes so that we could, when we started, we didn't want to take it too seriously. We didn't want to start an Instagram account or anything. We didn't want to add another level of, like, artistic thing that we have to, like, market all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, we were like, all right, well, if we at least if we make a couple and kind of save them, then we can kind of release them and not have to think too hard about, like, oh, we had to keep up a schedule or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that turned into... Oh, like a whole calendar year of us trying to record stuff and it not working out. So then <laughs> we started recording more um, in like the late summer, maybe fall of last year. And we've we've done like seven or eight episodes now. Um, nice. And they kind of come out whenever we can make it happen. But How long are the episodes? It ranges. We tried to, you know, keep them under an hour, but, you know. Okay. Yeah, but it kind of depends. And what, where can people find it? Uh, all the, the the Spotify and Apple, I think specifically, um, and it's called Musicians Movie Club. Musicians Movie Club. I've, I I had a movie podcast before this one. This is my third one. I had friends similar to what you had. Yeah, I had one originally called Friends at Music that I did for eight years, and then the next one was Mandate Movies, and it was one oh, I did cool. with my friend. It was, it was two men, so I just called it Mandate. Mandate sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun, <laughs> but it was mostly something we did passively and then the pandemic happened and we just kind of stopped yeah and i started this one up um three years ago and yeah so i've been i've been doing podcasting for quite some time 11 almost 12 years yeah yeah there was there was not as many when i first started in 2012 it, it wasn't even that popular mm-hmm. to have when i f- i didn't even know what they were my cousin was like you know a podcast start i was like no he explained it he said he wanted to do it and we, we interview people about music yeah I said, let's do it, and yeah, I haven't stopped. Well, as a format, I, I had been following a, a comedy group on YouTube called Mega64, and they had started a podcast in, like, 2006. Oh, and, wow. um, and so I had been, like, kind of listening to that as a, you know, a format for a long time. And um, it is funny how the pandemic, you know, it ended one of your podcasts, but I think it it created many, it, like, proliferated for <laughs> a lot of people. I, I knew a couple guys on Facebook who, like... Um, started a podcast and it kind of exemplified the kind of running gag now of of like a podcast being like so unnecessary because they were like the first i think it was called like i i don't want to like call out people they won't see this but um it was called like interesting topics or something and it was like episode one ai or whatever (laughs) and it's like oh god um but yeah i don't know it's it's I'm just really fond of the format. Like, it's fun to talk, and it's, like, a, it's sharing mm-hmm. sharing a community and, mm-hmm. and, like, you know, storytelling and stuff. So, like, I, whatever, you know. It's, and people would be amazed. You can get a lot out of one where it's not even famous or important. Totally. Or well-renowned people in their field. Just people talking about experiences is yeah. actually a lot more enticing than we realize. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When we do the Movie Club podcast, it's like, you know, I, I think um, – we kind of energize people to talk about something that they're passionate about specifically, and I think that's always a valid thing to listen to. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody is like, "I love this movie, and here's why," even if I disagree. Like, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, we did an episode with Bridget from OK Cool, and mm-hmm. and she wanted to talk about Kill Bill, and sorry, Bridget, but uh, you know, like, it's pretty clear that I'm not like a huge fan of Kill Bill, but I like it was, you know, like it, it was uh, like a fun thing to engage with, like, yeah. how much she loved it, you know, and yeah. like that's that's always fun for me, you know. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, every bigger movie or movie made by a bigger director, yeah, they're polarizing. They're going to have people who love them and hate them. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to be married to the fact if, like, someone of importance made something like it, it must be good. Like, it has mm-hmm. to be good, which isn't always true. There yeah. are some where, at least to make it, like, mid-tier quality, yeah. just good. It's never bad. It's always, like, this is just okay. Yeah. Like, it's well-made. Maybe I don't care for the writing or the story, but... The production and the acting and the way it looks is phenomenal. You know, yeah. there's like there's music, there are um, directors who do that kind of work all the time. You know, yeah, I've I've for better or worse become extremely discerning with with movies because uh, whether it's the 
you know, undergrad for four years and then a master's program in film and like the way that I've been sort of like uh, my brain has been taught to to find the codes and things and to mm-hmm. like to really heavily critique every little element against everything else, which is not always maybe the most fair. But have it's you just trained like, yourself to not do that? Uh, that's uh, I I've trained myself to appreciate. I think maybe things that I have very personally found to love. Mm-hmm. Um, so that it is very high risk, high reward, I suppose. Um, because I was just thinking about this maybe even last night. Uh, I went to go see Iron Claw. I've been wanting to see that. Yeah. I was actually going to see it yesterday. Yeah, it was it was good. It was a really solid film, very well-rounded, well-directed movie. But I was, I'm also a wrestling fan, and I was getting kind of like picky about like some of the like ways that it was sort of put together. And I think for most people that story is going to be like impossibly effective and like really emotional and like, um, it's a messed up story. Yeah. It's crazy. And the funny thing is like, they don't even go all the way. There's a, a a whole nother brother in the family that's not included in the film. That's also has this tragic. Yeah. There's five brothers that die, right? Yeah. And there's, uh, Von Eriks, the Von Eriks. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one who's not even in the movie because they thought it would be too much. People wouldn't like the, the, I I, wouldn't believe that this actually happened because it was like everyone dies. Yeah. One, yeah, so, it's a crazy story. Yeah, and I guess my brain was kind of, I was a little off put because sometimes things were so dramatic in the sense that Hollywood kind of like Oscar kind of genre dramas are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to spoil the movie or anything, but it's it. There were there were moments that were like, and something happens um, directly after, like a really positive thing happens, and then a really tragic thing happens. Like within, it makes it feel like it's one after the other like that night or mm-hmm. whatever but in reality it was like two years later and for whatever reason I, I was just like well that's kind of something only a movie would do and it's it's in it's done in the for the sake of dramatic storytelling mm-hmm. um but and that kind of bugs me mm-hmm. and i kind of don't like um the way that i guess hollywood if you if you're taking yourself that seriously it's very hard to earn i don't know the earn those things well, it's been the problem with big Hollywood f- forever. Yeah. has been uh, over-dramatizing things, missing key th- nuances that make something very realistic. Like, they didn't have to go that way. They could have yeah. left it practical in some way as far as the effects. Um, yeah, just little errors in in simple physical things like the set and the way they set it up and the timelines and years – I'm sometimes I'm just I'm also a stickler, but I I yeah. like to not be that way unless I'm like watching it to analyze it. Yeah. Same with music. Yeah. If I'm just gonna listen to it or watch it for fun, I'll just do that. I'll try not to get obsessed with like analyzing everything. But there's so many times where like time ge- geography they just mess it up. They're like, yeah, you know, he's 50 in the movie and and it's 1972, but for some reason he's born in like 1905. Yeah. It's like what that math like that was so easy to not make that mistake, but you mm-hmm. made it. Happens all the time in TV shows and movies. They change things around for no reason. And I don't I don't know. I, Hollywood's been doing it forever. Whatever can make it that much more enticing or dra- dramatized or action or comedic, they'll go for it. Even if it is at you know, it, it makes it more of like a shortcoming in the film. But. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that maybe the Iron Claw story was something that maybe just deserved to be like a mini series because it, it seemed like it should have. been. Yeah, there's a just, lot going on there. Just to earn all of it, you know, just to take the time because I, like the first half of the movie is awesome and it's just like a little slower and it's kind of more character driven and you know them like kind of teaching you about their their relationship as brothers and then you know when it kind of starts unraveling the, the more tragic events of their lives then it kind of feels like it's happening really fast. Mm. Um, so. Do you think it's a product of uh, the new TV show mindset where we have long-form shows? It feels like making a movie now that we have so many miniseries and long shows that can tell stories over a decade of television that's on HBO or Netflix so they could show – it's like a radar movie. They could show everything. Yeah. I wonder if that's made – had a huge effect on like the movie, the idea of an hour and 40-minute movie instead of 20 hours, 30 hours. You, you have to find a way to make everything still have its sections and overlap. And like you said earlier, like time went on. Yeah. But it was like the next scene, even though it was years. Yeah. It, it's um, 
it's yeah i think the tv shows have taught us collectively maybe that you know how drama can be a little bit more subtle and take place over a greater uh period of of like film pacing mm-hmm. uh, on the other hand there's a lot of movies that are coming out that are way too long mm-hmm. which is like um like Oppenheimer, I thought was a great movie, but maybe just like thirty minutes too long. Mm-hmm. Or you know, uh, Poor Things, uh, the New Yorker's Lance most movie, same yeah. kind of thing. Like we're making a lot of three-hour movies these days, which maybe didn't. Killer of the Flower Moon. Killers, I loved Killers of the Flower Moon. Three and a half hours. Yeah, it yeah. was it was really long, but I was I was I was really hooked. Yeah. Um, what what were your thoughts? This is a spoiler, because this this was a, a big thought I had. What was your yeah. thought on the idea that they revealed? what would have been the climax throughout the whole thing. Like, the whole time you knew that he was just poisoning his wife, and that easily could have just been hidden, and then Robert De Niro could reveal that at the end for everyone to be like, oh, Leo's been killing her the whole time. There was yeah. none, none of that. So it was a very anticlimactic ending, mm-hmm. almost nothing. It just, it just, they were telling you as it just happened. Like, this is what he did, this is what they did, and then it ends. Like, it didn't have that, and that was the only thing that was like, that could have been one switch they did where he's po- – they show her giving insulin, mm-hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio, to his wife. But they never show you that he's the one that's been mixing the co- – he doesn't even realize that he's being tricked because he's, yeah. he's not uh, 100% intelligent up in his brain. And uh, <laughs> But, yeah, they don't have that. And I was like – it was just so – there was no reveal. I don't yeah. know if that was on purpose and the reveal was supposed to be – Anybody who was a minority suffering that always had to see everything happen right in front of them in there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I almost put you in that shoe, which I respect that. But, man, it did not have, like, most of his movies have some type of something happens and there is nothing. It was just kind of, like, looked great, well-written, yeah. amazing acting, great production, loved the music, story's great. I just missed, there was just something not enticing with that part of it. Yeah. I can't, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I so I watched this, um, this video of him kind of talk, Scorsese talking about uh, his movies uh, in a career sense and he talked about Killers of the Flower Moon and he was talking about the pre-production and, the, and how he was um, approaching the script uh, mm-hmm. especially because it's, you know, adapted from that book mm-hmm. and supposedly the book is way more about the, uh, kind of what happens towards the like last third of the movie where the FBI kind of starts coming in and the, the formation of, of the FBI. But he was saying that what he thought was the most interesting part of the story was the relationship um, between Leo's character and, and uh, Lily Gladstone's character and how it's like this kind of long, slow betrayal and this like long twisting of the knife and how tragic that is and their ro- like their relationship is like sort of the real core of the story. Mm. And the, and But what also was so entertaining and engaging for me was that it was a very Martin Scorsese movie. It was very like, it, he pretty much just had Goodfellas take place in Oklahoma, which I thought was awesome. I was like, when it started happening, when you start seeing people kind of get knocked off in, you know, in these kind of kooky machinations of a of a pseudo mafia, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, he's doing it. He hid this <laughs> gangster movie <laughs> inside of a He a definitely did. Piece. It was awesome. I was also wondering, I was like, if Leo is rich and in this family and doing that, why is he partaking in these hits and, like, committing the crimes in public? Like, in, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was what I was like, I don't think they'd have him doing that, especially considering who he is. They probably would have, He, you know, he has the money and he's the face of the family from his uncle. You'd think that he'd keep him hitting him, like, don't go out or stealing and hurting people in public where people can see you and find you. I feel like they would have hired you know, henchmen to do that or some local kid to do that stuff. But yeah, I guess it's an aspect of another kind of Scorsese trope, which is like this dedication to the family and the cause. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. and De Niro's character is kind of extra sleazy for being kind of this public figure who is yeah. being vile uh, behind the scenes, but he's in the court or in the council and he's like, yeah, we should send someone to D.C. to to yeah. protect us. This yeah. is this can this must stop, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So man, he's he's the best, Scorsese. And he's, he's made some great movies. Yeah. Yeah, I liked his I did like Oppenheimer too. Nolan makes some fun ones and there were some cool movies this year. I didn't see I didn't see that many, as many as I used to. I used to go like every Monday. Yeah. At the the theater. I lived out in the suburbs for a while. And this Marcus Theater in Orland Park had uh 
five dollar Tuesdays, but I yeah. would go on Mondays. And it was six dollars, no tax, and every tenth film because you get in rewards. Every tenth film's free, mm-hmm. so I would just go every Monday at like eight a.m. First person in the theater. <laughs> There's like three employees there, so it's clean, it's yeah. quiet, doesn't smell weird yet. It was amazing. Yeah. I feel like a personal theater. Alone. In Alone. The, yeah, no one in there. You can hear everything. You could sit yeah. in the right spot. Yeah. You can hear everything. You could see everything. It's the darkest the theater ever gets. It's the cleanest. It's great. Yeah. And I went all the time, but right before the pandemic, ever since then, it's been less. I still mm-hmm. go, but not as often. Yeah. Yeah. Before before the pandemic, I had, uh, well, Movie Pass came out like in maybe 2019 or something. And I had Movie Pass for a while, and then that kind of collapsed on itself. <laughs> and AMC respond, like, responded with the AMC stubs program mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i got that and it was you could see up to three movies a week and it was like twenty dollars a month and i was like that's unreal so mm-hmm. i would go i would just see everything i yeah. was just, i you know only worked a couple days a week at the time and i was like i'm gonna see everything i saw 47 meters down two or whatever <laughs> like yeah. i was like I, i'll see it it's fun though when you could see everything because you yeah. get an idea and a feel for like what is going on in pop culture. Totally, you know, and too many people just go see the big movies and they don't. They are the same people that go like, "Oh, there's no good movies anymore." It's like the same type of people that say there's no good music anymore. Yeah, they listen to like the top ten records that are out that week. It's like, well, I would be discouraged too if that's all I listened to mm-hmm. was the most run of the mill, straightforward, formulaic, basic art. Yeah. yeah, I'd get bored too, and I'd wonder what's going on. You got to go outside that. You yeah. have to, and there could be good stuff within that formula. Don't get me wrong mm-hmm. of of big movies, big blockbusters, big albums, but there's a lot more than just that. It takes a little effort. You know? you, yeah, you got to you got to treat it like a, a real hobby. Yeah, you got to put in the effort, research what movies are coming out, go to different theaters, look up different directors, and it's the same thing with albums. I mean, there's a million albums are released every you know, year, you'll find some good, Yeah, you'll find some good stuff out there. It's like the YouTube comments though, on those Led Zeppelin videos that are like, they don't make it like this anymore. This is, I was born in the wrong generation. Yeah. And it was like, there's bands literally copying Led Zeppelin. That like you could identical <laughs> and they play cleaner and they're not as sloppy because they learned a lot the last 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. of course. So how did you get into filmmaking? Cause you, did you go to school for film in Chicago or? Uh, so as far as school for film, I, I, my undergrad was at Kansas. Um, and then I, I got my master's at DePaul. And that's, okay. That's why they have I, a really great film. Yeah, it, program it, at the Paul. Yeah, big one. Um, and uh, that's why I moved to Chicago too. Okay. So, uh, okay. I'm from St. Louis originally. Okay. And, and uh, how old are you? I'm 28. Okay. So you finished more recently? Yeah, I finished my master's this past June. Oh wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, and was it a two or three year program? It was three. Okay. Yeah. Um, and growing up in St. Louis, so my father uh, was in broadcast journalism and sports broadcasts and so we had various camera technology around the house um, including a vhs camera Um, and me and my brother kind of started with the vhs camera like in our basement Mm -hmm. and goofing off with that and making silly films there was one where uh i like was bouncing on this mini trampoline in our house and then he played a trampoline thief and he came in and he stole the trampoline (laughs) i don't really remember what happens after that but um, I wonder if kids are going to make those kind of goofy videos because you could just make it on your phone now. Yeah. And with the ability to just erase, delete, edit, like do all that just yeah. on your phone, will it have the same? Because I used to put so much effort into those and get yeah. the lighting and charge the battery and get a f- clean VHS and make sure no one was around because you didn't want to get caught using the camera or you get yelled yeah. by, you know, <laughs> all these little details. And now it's like a kid could just be like, do a take and be like, no, that wasn't good. Forget it. We'll do it another time. It was just no effort, no worries, no yeah. worry about storage or taking up someone else's stuff, you know? Well, it's like you also have to kind of have the drive to want to do those things. Like, I don't know if maybe TikTok or something is maybe... It's, it's taking that up, that it, space. Yeah. I, I Maybe that, well, maybe one day in... 12 years would be two people sitting on a podcast and they're like, I started filmmaking with TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> that could, I mean, that could be the case or it could be like, I don't know. I think maybe people are, younger people are way more into consuming than they are creating. Maybe it's like some of the more like options um, are just more limited when I was mm-hmm. a, a kid. So, I mean, we still had video games, you know, and we could go play outside or something, but like... The video games were just not less, as enticing. Just less. They couldn't keep you... That in, like Super Mario, Super Mario World is great. It's a fun yeah. game. 
will it keep you engaged for weeks on end yeah. for like 12 hours a day? No. Or battle pass, keep you there for <laughs> months or whatever? But there are games now, but because you can log in via the internet, headset, haptic feedback, be in group chats, whatever, mm-hmm. the, the fact they can just consume like every part of your senses, it makes it a lot harder to, yeah. to leave it or get out of it. And that's the thing, like they're really great, well made. I love video games. I just... I kind of stay away. Yeah. Stay away from them. Yeah, I grew up and, yeah, I grew, I played a lot of video games as a kid, but now that I'm a little older, I just kind of, uh, my creative drive is a little stronger than my, sure. like, um, I don't know, video games kind of don't, I'm just kind of following a path maybe. Yeah. Maybe that's why I don't, like, yeah. it's a predetermined thing. Um, not to, like, crap on video games because I, Which is crazy you know, because whatever. to make them and the yeah. sound design and the video work, and the voice work is remarkable. Like it's a huge journey, and really creative to make them. Yeah. Uh, the issue with them is they're so good and so adapted to our modern dopamine needs that mm-hmm. they've gotten a little too addictive, a little too. It, it makes people stay in that world for too long. It's not real. Yeah. It's not a real world. So it's cool if people can have a healthy healthy relationship. Just play it here and there. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah. It's the overindulgence, the student. No, it doesn't leave their bedroom for the whole weekend because yeah. it's playing, you know. And that's really real. Yeah. Yeah, but you – so you said you're from St. Louis. Yeah. And then you went to Kansas State? Uh, University of Kansas. University yeah. of Kansas. Jayhawks. Jayhawks. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what city – is that in Wichita? Lawrence, Kansas. Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah. That's about 30, 40 minutes west Lawrence, of Kansas City. Kansas. Yeah. Okay. I've never been. So just around the se- the geographical center of the nation – Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I forgot uh, that's in Kansas. <laughs> the only thing Kansas is known for. And that, it's um, also really flat. Yes. Uh, fl- well, Lawrence, Kansas is like the one place in Kansas where there are two big hills, and that's where <laughs> uh, the University of Kansas is is, is built. So, okay. So, like, you, uh, you, uh, you live on one hill, or at least if you're a freshman, they call it Daisy Hill, and then campus is on... The other hill, so you have to go way down and then come all How the way back up. How far is that distance? It's not so. It's not super far, like but a it's quarter mile or something. Yeah, but it's like it was such a pain. And I built. They called the KU calves because you you walk a, you're uh. walking up hills all the time, <laughs> and it's also made it really windy because yeah. it's just like the yeah. plains just like conjure up the wind. So Lawrence, Kansas, the other windy city. The winds out in the Great Plains are outrageous. Yeah, I mean you see so many windmills out there, you know. Um. Yeah, like all that home video stuff. Mm-hmm. It, I think it, it got exacerbated, and I like I think the um, emphasized by when YouTube coming out, and I became like fascinated with YouTube, especially like early YouTube when it was just where it was way more democratized, and sort of anything could be on your front page. Yeah, um, your evolution of dance or. Um, Charlie bit my finger era of yeah, YouTube, yeah, uh, or a sneezing panda. Remember a sneezing panda? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> like, but and then like sketch comedy kind of really came out of that. And uh-huh. I think since we were kind of already doing a little bit of that as like kids, I was like, this is the best thing in the world. So that was kind of like the really like, oh man, yeah, we gotta we gotta make YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And so I got some of my neighborhood friends, and we kind of started doing just like dumb skits. Mm-hmm. Um, and then going into high school, I wanted to keep doing it, but um, with a uh, purpose, I suppose. So, uh, <laughs> so we, I, I, I joined the uh, broadcast journalism uh, oh. program at my high school, and from there, decided to go to film school. It was a class, a set of classes. Yeah, or? my my high school, in just in particular, for whatever reason, was a very prestigious journalism program um, for the high school. Yes. I was going to um, say, I've never heard of a broad class, broadcast journalism class for high school. Yeah, and, you know, in some places it's just like they do the morning announcements, you know, or whatever. But uh, we, through the journalism program, they, you know, produced uh, this monthly newspaper. And then the yearbook was like a huge, huge year-long production. And, like, it was just a huge deal at, at my high school. Um, and um, the advisor, his name is Aaron Manful, who's like a great mentor of mine at the time. He uh, was just like this incredible journalism teacher and like really encouraged us and kind of treated us like adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, we learned Adobe Creative Suite and stuff in, mm-hmm. in high school, and I think that was like really important. So you learned on Premiere? 
I did, and I still use Premiere. Okay. You uh, ever use Final Cut or just Premiere? Oh, we used the Final Cut a little bit in high school, and I never. When Final Cut X came out, it was just iMovie on steroids, and it was just like it was a bummer. So it was. I was like, we got it. We got it. Premiere. We got to use Premiere. I like Premiere more. Okay. Yeah. I've used it a couple times, but I've always learned on. I learned audio and video stuff on Apple stuff on Logic and Final Cut. Yeah. So it's one of those things like once you learn it. You start to learn everything about it. It's hard to undo that and go to like a new DAW, sure. a new software. But I have used Premiere and Adobe Audition a lot. Yeah. I, I still do like the Final Cut Logic thing. I think I'm just used to Apple software and interface and the flow of it and mm-hmm. the commands. You know, once you get used to it. It's, yeah, I grew up on PC stuff. Um, and I did until I got into the art stuff. And then I completely yeah. haven't looked back. And That's now fair. I can't even use PC stuff. I'm like, what is yeah. this? I uh for when I record demos and stuff I I got a copy of Fruity Loops FL mm-hmm. Studio um mm-hmm. when I was a teenager and I still use that to record my demos and things. Oh, you and, still do? Yeah. Nice. And uh I really wish I had a MacBook though because it seems like logic would be so much easier. It would be. Yeah. <laughs> it would be. But I mean there's some Adobe Audition since you have Adobe Premiere it's kind of cool. They yeah. can pretty much yeah. connect as far as audio video. And that would might probably be good since you make films to get to have Premiere and Adobe Audition, so you can get do more audio work in it, you know, yeah. at a higher level, and then just bring it right into Premiere. Yeah, did you do the audio work for your document, yeah. or it's more of a film? It's not really. It, it's, yeah, it's a film. There, it almost feels like a documentary. That's good. That's good to hear because um, I I wanted it to to incorporate. There are um, two sequences that are shot. As documentary style, okay. live performances, um, yeah, and I wanted all the live performances to feel real. And I noticed the live performances changed with audio quality. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed uh, that right away. It's yeah. live, but one is live with the microphones on yeah. the actual set feed mixed, and the mm-hmm. other one is probably a zoom in the in the room. There's, um, I there was a couple different. Uh, methods. So we shot some scenes at um, Book Club. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that are true documentary style where it was a live show that we just brought cameras to. Mm-hmm. Everything else is uh, um, constructed, but it was all based on what the venue had to offer us as far sure. as um, the PA and mixing and stuff. And we did all of our own stuff. Um, Chris Lee helped us out on at stuff VCR. At VCR. I could tell he mixed that. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. As soon as I heard it, I was like, Chris did this. Yeah. So Chris <laughs> Lee helped us out on that. And he also came out and. Um, uh, helped us at the the double door set. Um, double door. What year was this made? Uh, this was made in twenty twenty, but it's a, or what am I saying? Twenty twenty two. But um, it's the the new double door. There's a new double door. Yeah, they're working on it still. It was oh. sort of an active construction site that they were doing some DIY. And they shows let you at. go in. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of a long story. As they as, legally let you do something in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, this is pretty much. Uh, they were hosting DIY shows a little bit, and then um, is it the same? Lo- it's not the same location. No, it's in there's uptown. a Yeti now to that location. For yeah. those who don't know, who are <laughs> from uh, Chicago and Wicker Park, yeah, the Double Door was right there by Subterranean and uh, Chop Shop, and then now it's it's a Yeti cooler, mm. play, which cooler is bizarre store. to me because I grew yeah. up going to the Double Door, and now to like walk in there, I'm like, this is weird. Yeah, yeah. Well, so they yeah they're renovating this enormous uh, former bank in Uptown. It's um, hmm. just around the corner from um, the Riviera. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's a uh, it's a really cool looking place, and that was kind of and we we really tried to. Um, we tried to get a really cool venue for it's it's the kind of climax of the movie. Is it the end? Yeah, it looks like it was filmed in like the hallway, foyer area, right past security in in the Riviera. Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, like the lobby of the Riviera. I was like, are they in the Riviera? I was trying to figure out where it was. Yeah, okay. it, it's at this uh, this new double door kind of project. Um, I wonder when that opens up. They're still working on. I actually live over there now, and I kind of like see it out of the corner of my eye when I'm walking around. But um, I saw like the plans and things that they have for it. Mm-hmm. And they actually, if you want to like hear a little bit about it, um, James Van Osdall was hosting a little podcast series with the CardCon County guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, with um, um, with the guys who are the Double Door owners. Okay. Um, and they were kind of talking about the updates on it. I think, I like my perception is that the uh, renovations have kind of slowed down, 
but um, they could take a bit at these types of establishments. Like yeah, years. Oh yeah, years. it's a huge place. It would require a ton of money. Oh uh, okay, because yeah. they just I just went to the the Romova Theater on Thirty yeah. Fifth and Halstead. They just opened up New Year's Eve, and it's awesome. It's yeah. beautiful, great restaurant, brewery. I can't wait for that, but it's that's so it's just a like four minute walk from here. Oh, so nice! I'm glad to finally live next to a venue. I've waited my whole life for this, <laughs> and I fu- just so happened to move here a year and a half ago, and then this just opens up. I'm like this is great. Yeah, but I wish up by you on Lawrence and Broadway that they would open up the Uptown Theater. Oh yeah, All right, just just north of the Green Mill because they have the the Aragon Ballroom and they have the Riviera. Apparently, you can do Double Door. Mm. I just, yeah, the Uptown Theater, I'm like, this looks like a cool spot. Yeah, it looks, I, I, I you know, only lived in Chicago for three years now, and I, now Have that i Have you I'm, always lived in that area? Uh, kind of. I lived in, like, more of, like, Boys Town before, but then I just moved a little bit up the, okay. up the road, really. Um, but, uh, I just walked past there, and I was like, what is that? And I did my little research, and I was like, this place looks insane. It's, like, huge. They don't make movie theaters like that anymore, you know? Yeah. So I, it would be really, like, spectacular if they could get something done with it, but mm-hmm. I, it seems like it's a kind of a tough sell to have people invest in it. For yeah, those, you know, antique theaters that have, like, historical significance, they cost even more money. Mm-hmm. Like that, like the Remova, I think it was, like, $30 million. Because wow. not only is it need to be rehabbed and redone it has to be done exactly how it once was because it's an historical landmark oh once i think it's 92 years wow. 92 years or something it becomes a historical landmark and then you have to do everything exactly the way it was within reason that's interesting yeah so yeah. it's got some funky stuff because of that there's certain things they have to let go and certain things they have to do yeah so they can't just in it, like renovate it and put a yeti store in it yeah exactly <laughs> yeah they can't just do that um but it's it's cool because they can do stuff and make it look old fashioned, but it's bad because some some things just need to be done a different way and they they won't let you you have to go mm-hmm. back to the OG way from nineteen twenty five, you yeah. know. I but I mean that. I'm sure plumbing and electricity, they're like, Yes, please modernize that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the I think the structure and the facade, like superficial stuff. Sure. Mm-hmm. And I guess if you're doing like a a restaurant and everything in it too that's yeah. gonna be quite an undertaking oh yeah and the yeah. brewery's awesome it's huge these massive like 15 foot steel it looks like breaking bad chemistry wow. lab in there nice. yeah that's cool and so wait you you were at the paul mm-hmm. filmmaking there and i'm assuming you had to do some pretty cool projects there as a mfa Is yes right? mfa um technically local band was a uh, my thesis film oh nice um it was how did you meet all these bands? Um, so I'm decided I was living after after undergrad. I moved back to St. Louis, and I um, there started to get into local music in St. Louis, um, and was started starting to make some some sort of uh, DIY projects uh, with my friend Nick Wandersey, um, and we kind of, you know, we're just like so creative and prolific again. I was like, man, I was kind of struggling to find like a, a job in, in video in St. Louis. It's just, it's just kind of a dead town, honestly. And there's just like, as far as, you know, opportunities for that kind of thing, that's few and far between. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, I really want to double down and go back to school and see if I can take another shot at it. Um, especially because my undergrad degree was more theoretical. Um, and I wanted to get into production and have the resources and the opportunities and the people um, to kind of like use the things that I honed uh, producing films in a DIY sense in St. Louis um, and kind of give it another shot. So sure. so I decided I applied to grad schools and DePaul was going to have me and Chicago seemed like a perfect place to be for independent filmmaking especially. And so, not too far from home. Not too far from home either. Um, Chicago, like if you, if you grew up in St. Louis, Chicago is like, <laughs> like the... The way bigger, cooler, older brother. Um, way bigger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And people in Chicago are probably like, St. Louis, what do you... Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I've i driven through St. Louis a lot. Yeah. And that's the thing. I've just driven through it. No, yeah. I've been there when I was a kid. It was cool. The arches, all that jazz. Mm-hmm. But I've never gone back since. I've just driven through it to go to, like, Dallas. Just drove through it. And I've never yeah, actually, like, hung out there, you know? Yeah, you don't need to. It's fine. <laughs> um, He's like... You don't have to feel bad. Don't yeah, worry. it's fine. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, 
So I came to DePaul, and unfortunately, I had applied for grad school, gotten in, and then class was going to start uh, in August 2020, which there was something happening in the world at the time. Yes, um, there was. It was a bad time to start grad school. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, I, just, I couldn't bring myself to just stay in, at home. So I was like, all right, at least I'm going somewhere. So I moved to Chicago, and our first year of class was all online. So you moved here in August of 2020. Yes. You start... Um, DePaul is a tri-semester. They start mm-hmm. right after Labor Day. Yeah. And oh, I didn't even go there. I know these things. And, <laughs> uh, and so you start at, like, one of the worst times to start school ever. Or be social and connect with the community. Yes, with people you've never met. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that Chicago was, they were pretty strict about it back then. Yeah, totally. And so, first, yeah, first year of class was all online. It was pretty rough. Um, I bet. Um, I was I was teaching at, at, I still am teaching, but I was teaching at that time, and it was brutal to teach the classes online. I hated it. Mm-hmm. Did not like it, especially all my classes are creative. All music production, they're all time-based media projects. To do that via Zoom, yeah, with twenty people, it was it was terrible. Yeah. I did not learn anything. My students didn't. It was a mess across the board as far as education and as a student goes. Yeah, so and I can only imagine. Where do you teach? If you don't I mind teach at ISU, Illinois State University. Mm-hmm. I drive down there in Bloomington. Okay. Well, you know, one third away from Chicago to St. Louis. Yeah, if you know the I I fifty five drive down mm-hmm. to St. Louis. So I I go down there on Tuesdays and Thursdays to Bloomington Normal and I teach four classes. Uh, it was my sixth year there, and then uh, I teach on Wednesdays at Columbia College Chicago. I teach some audio classes. Oh, cool! There. So, do that, and then the other days are recording bands, podcasts, sessions, albums, all that jazz. Yeah. Hell yeah! yeah that's that's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. So Zoom class was miserable. Not, not good. Yeah, <laughs> um, but the good news was that um, I really liked. Um, the chair of the program, his name's Dan Klein. Um, he's very, very encouraging, especially of my stuff, um, for whatever reason. And, um, you know, we, we kind of made it work as far as like socializing and kind of trying to make friends with the cohort, um, of other people in the program. And I was in film, film and tele- television directing MFA, uh, which is a relatively smaller program at DePaul. Mm-hmm. Um, but then since the previous year of classes had kind of like, um, collapsed because of COVID also, they kind of also came in with us. So there was sort of this mixed level, uh, bigger group of people. And yeah, that was, that was kind of rough. But, um, then coming into 2021 by the summer, um, cause COVID kind of dipped a little bit in the summer of 21 shows kind of came back a little bit. And I, my first show in Chicago was at the, uh, the golden dagger and I saw a super kick playing um which was um which was awesome because i guess i had kind of gotten tipped off into some chicago local music through a few things through um i had been posting some solo music online and um eric hansen at the local music show on uh, at harper college harper radio uh had just picked up one of my songs from the internet and was like hey can i play this and you're a chicago-based musician i was like yeah, sure. And I started kind of listening to his show, and that tipped me off to some people. Um, if you if you don't listen to a local music show on Harp Radio, please do. And then also, I uh, I discovered OK Cool. I think through um, a undergrad friend of mine was friends with Haley on Facebook and had liked OK Cool on Facebook. And then I was like, "What is this? Chicago mm-hmm. local music?" And so then and this was the summer of two thousand twenty one. Yes, um, and. From there, I kind of stumbled into Superkick, and then I was like, this is, I'm going to see music live again. So he was like, and they're playing at a close place. Let's go. And so I went, and I met those guys for the first time, and through there, th- from there, it was kind of just like a domino effect, mm-hmm. finding bands, going to shows. And then by the beginning of 2022, um, I had started playing music with the Damager guys. Um, our first show was November 9th, 2021 at Golden Dagger also. And through playing with Damager and then we put together a show which will kind of, you know, always live on in my memory is one of my, you know, like a, this amazing night which was we played at Book Club. It was 
Damager, Nora Marks, OK Cool, and Superkick. And this was like the beginning of this incredible community of friends um, and like mm-hmm. bands that I love kind of all coming together. I met so many people there. I met the Cut Your Losses people there. Um, and then the following night was Pink Squeeze and Cut Your Losses at Beat Kitchen and the same thing. And it was like all of a sudden it was like, wait, are we going to see each other at the same places all the time? This is so much, you know, like this yeah. rules. And that was like, it kind of just kind of blossomed out from there. And I started meeting all these people. And That's awesome. And uh, as far as local band the movie goes, um, I had originally had the idea for a, a band about – or a, a, ba- a movie about a band um, because I, I loved – I just already loved movies about fictional bands as a genre, um, like That Thing You Do mm-hmm. and School of Rock and Smile Tap, Tap and, yeah. like, all that stuff. And it just made a lot of sense to me as a as a musician and a filmmaker. Also, um, what's the big one? Almost Famous? Almost Famous. Love yeah. Almost Famous. Yeah. 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 Um, because it has this, like, sense of satire, um, but also, like, a kind of genuine heart for the love of, mm-hmm. of that kind of art and performance. Mm-hmm. Um so when I was in St. Louis still and kind of going to see local musicians there was where it kind of clicked for me that I was like, I should take these two things that I really like, um, which is I want to – I love movies about bands and I like the concept of local music as a community and mm-hmm. as like a sort of Sis- Sisyphean <laughs> task um, because I was seeing these local musicians and I was kind of like, this band is called, you know – shit blaster and they're playing at you know the sinkhole on a tuesday night like that's that's they must know right (laughs) like (laughs) like this like you're not going to be at coachella you know or whatever Mm -hmm. like but you know it's a like a valid kind of uh in my mind sort of almost heroic kind of choice to pursue something you love so deeply with the knowledge that it's kind of maybe futile I've done that a lot. Yeah. In so many things. So I, I, I respect the game and appreciate the effort because you can't really get anything out of it if you don't put in that effort. No one's going to just go up their first night and there's 300 people and yeah. everyone paid and they got paid really well and now all their gigs are set. Like that's not how it works. Yeah. Very few people ever even get a chance to have that. Um, but yeah, it's you most of the time the people are not doing it for money and fame. They're doing yeah. it because they want to express themselves, they want to show people their art, they want to enjoy it with friends, play mm-hmm. play it with so there's nothing more fun than playing in a band with your friends and everything that you planned in your studio or your practice space worked out and you did it live and everyone played well. There could be no one there and it's still like a cool feeling. Yeah. Now when there are people there, it's even better feeling. Mm-hmm. When they get something out of it and you could see it and they come talk to you afterwards, that's even a better feeling when it, when it, you know, when they go buy your record or your shirt after. Like those things yeah. are great, but it is a labor of love. It's a very thankless job and pursuit. Mm-hmm. Everyone involved with it, it's thankless. The sound people, the lighting people, the door people, all thankless. It's well, a brutal one. Yeah. And then another facet of it is once you do have people start showing up, then that little evil voice in your vein, your brain is starting to go, well, what if we, uh, what if it did start to work out or whatever? Yeah. And I think that's another element of kind of a, the drama, I suppose. And you never know what works. There yeah. are some bands that blow up and I hear it. I'm like, I don't understand how they're famous. Same thing yeah. with directors. Yeah. I'm just like, if Zack Snyder is allowed to make one more movie, mm-hmm. how is this possible? How does he keep making movies? <laughs> he is a dedicated cult of some kind. You he know? does, but yeah. I'm like, has he? I don't think he's ever made a movie. I was like, wow, this is awesome. Like, I don't think so. I mean, 300 was awesome if you're like 12. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Like it was <laughs> yeah. if you're a kid. Because you're like, whoa, muscles and death. Yeah. And like weird graphic novel look. But like, it's not a good movie. No. Like, it's good. Yeah. It's a fun movie. Yeah, he's uh, <laughs> he's a cinematographer that got the job as a director. So. Yeah, I, there are some directors like how, and there's the same thing with music. I'm like, how do they keep getting the okay to make this music? Yeah. And then there are some people that are amazing, and mm-hmm. you're like, how does no one know who they are? Mm-hmm. That's what I've prided myself on the last 14 years of what I do. This long list of festivals is finding bands that are awesome that nobody knows about. Yeah. Some have gotten really big afterwards. Some have taken off. It was a funny joke in your documentary. I keep saying documentary. In your film, Local Band, Featureland film, one hour and 37 minutes? Uh, 
I should know this. I think no, it is. <laughs> I, think know, it is. I, I haven't looked at it in a while. I'm pretty I sure it was. Our, I think it's hour 17, actually. Is it? Yeah. I don't know why I saw a seven. I yeah. just threw a, th- a three in there. Yeah. Maybe it is an hour and 17. I thought it would have hit over 80 because it doesn't have to be considered, like over 80 to be considered feature length. Most, by festival definitions, actually only has to be over 45. That's it? Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. not that long mm-hmm. for a feature. That's like a TV episode. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Anyway. But the like, the, the sweet spot is between 110 and probably, you know, wherever. 130. Mm-hmm. Yeah, around two hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a joke after one of the bands played. It, they might have been, were they drinking in the alleyway? The guy was drinking a bottle or something like that after yeah. the, one of the first bands. And he was like, pretty soon we can open up for, open up for Beach Bunny. Yeah. And I just started <laughs> laughing <laughs> because it's like, you know, I, after working with them and they've gotten so unbelievably popular. Yeah. I hear people bring them up all the time. I hear them in the store. I mean, I I know them, and I've worked with them a few times, and they used to play at the coffee shop around my house and open up for my friends' bands, like, when I, like just five years ago, six mm-hmm. years ago. So, yeah, it's their popularity is interesting, but to hear that in that movie, it just made me laugh so hard. And then now knowing the full circle thing of you went to DePaul and they're from DePaul, it's a little funny, you know. It's, I mean, it's like, That's it, just it's mythology. You know, it's I mean, a coincidence, but. Yeah, well, like, as a... Uh, I don't know, as a uh, as someone coming into Chicago and a little bit younger, it's mythology. They're the Chicago DIY success story. Yeah, you know of like uh, the uh, and it's I in, even beyond Chicago. It's like that's a band that was playing oh, they're DIY international, stuff. They're and then, internationally famous. Yeah, and but then TikTok. They, yeah, t- t- you know? TikTok did it. For TikTok this. did it. They're a cool band. They are. They're good. I I like them. But Me they, too, by the way. I, <laughs> the, but they <laughs> don't have um, the longevity pre their fame to be good for me to consider like a, a staple like DIY band. Yeah, like they were playing shows for like a couple years mm-hmm. and then blew up. Like that's not. I want. I want to hear like a decade or fifteen years under your belt before I go. Mm-hmm. Like that's a staple. Yeah. But you know, three years at the age of twenty, not so much. Mm-hmm. Not anything against their popularity now, but like you know, it was. The, yeah. I mean, the joke was a little bit more pointed at the kind of delusion of, of oh. the DIY success story than. Oh, the, okay. Like, well, it's not a way. shot. It's not a shot at Beach Bunny in any way. Okay, it was more about like that character and his his delusions of grandeur as yeah. a musician. You know, people yeah. doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and like. And you know he's also then later in the scene suggests we need to we need to get fans we need to get on TikTok and make funny TikToks and uh, like matching mm-hmm, mm-hmm. clothes and mm-hmm. which is like it's really funny I I would say that because I wrote that movie in um, summer twenty one mm-hmm. and uh, now that I've kind of uh, been playing in Chicago in a band for uh, over two years now I would totally write a lot of it very differently. Um, uh, that makes sense. But I still think that joke actually is something that I still hold very tightly because I think, like, I've met, like, Nashville bands that are, like, totally that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, like, and L.A. bands, too, where it's, like, they're, like, I saw this L.A. band playing at a local bill um, at the Burlington here um, last summer, and they had, like, custom baseball jerseys with their band name on it and they're like they've got like four different things on 12 inch vinyl they've got you know three t-shirts with different designs they got buttons and stickers it sounds like they either spent a lot of money or made a lot of money i think they spent a lot of money (laughs) because they were playing the burlington um and which is great i love playing the burlington yeah but but (laughs) like for an la band like i can just tell that the whole deal is more so like um you don't need baseball jerseys like the the music should be good and then you should like i don't know like it just seemed like <laughs> posturing to me and it's like like uh, i know what you're saying you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah. it's just like there's a kind of approach that is so much more about branding and the tiktok and everything than 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 it is the music and the performance and the, like and the energy of your group yes you know i like I'm not gonna I'm I'm not against people using TikTok to be to increase their success because you should, but 
And sometimes it just feels disingenuous. And I kind of think that that is what I was trying to poke fun yeah. at more than anything. It's hard to know when, though. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's kind of like a friend of mine says, you know, you know what porn is when you see it. <laughs> and it's the same with that. It's like you don't, you just know when you see it, but you can't, like, describe it or call it out. You just yeah. have to see it, and you just know. Like, your toes curl, your eyes flutter, and you get blushed, and you're like, yeah, that's what's going on right now. This person's being very fake versus the person that is doing it solely to promote the music and is just treating it like a job. Like, yeah, I got to make my clips for the new this and just put it out. Like, yeah. that's it. They're not taking it very seriously, but they are taking it seriously. Like, they're mm -hmm. doing it. But for some reason, you can't really describe it or, or articulate it until you see it. And then you see it and you go, that's what that is. You just yeah. know it when you see it. And I don't know any other way around it, but you do have to live through Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, X, YouTube, you know, um, yeah. shorts. Like all of that, you have to put your work out there. I mean, very few people can get away with not doing that. And there are a very specific type of people that can. They're usually either really famous already. Yeah. Have a lot of money, which is usually the famous part. Nepotism. Uh, nepotism, and then the th the the last one. Say there's four: famous, money, nepotism, and then the last one is uh, like really, really good looking. Like really, good looking. like <laughs> yeah. like so good looking that everyone ever goes, "You're good looking." Yeah, like good their looking whole and life. Good music. You're set. If you have nepotism, money, fame. You don't even have to make good music, and you're good looking. You will be famous. Yeah. No, if there is no way around it. Yeah. In fact, I just described most of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Ooh, shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there is still work. You know, it's still just work, and even to um, appropriate ends. Uh, so, like, I was actually kind of explaining this to somebody, um, maybe someone back home when I went home for the holidays about like what I want to do with the band. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like. I really want to make music and record music right now, specifically write and record music this year. And the end of that is mostly about A, to keep to keep it fresh as far as the performance goes, but also because releases fuel shows, and I just want to keep playing shows. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. And so it's like, I think for the same reason you could argue, you know, like doing the work and like posting every day on your Instagram or making the TikToks and stuff can also just be the work as far as gaining their your totally genuine realistic ends of playing more, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and recording more, you know, having the resources. So that's the other end of that. Again, you, you know when you see it. Um, yeah, you do. And with this movie, we were talking about it before we started the podcast, but local band – um you don't have a future release for you because you're yeah. working on the, the circuit right now for the, the um, film festivals. Yeah. So could you go into the depth about the film festivals, like criterias and things like that, like mm -hmm. what you've maybe learned that you didn't know? Um, it's kind of funny because they, they, they kind of try to prepare you in school very quickly at the very end <laughs> to, uh, about this part of the process. Um, so in Nepal's program, at least, they actually intended for all of us to make a short film as your thesis, it is the way that the program is set up. And since I already had this idea for this feature film, and also because I had made enough stuff on my own to where it felt like the short film format was not as appealing to me at this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I also just think that the the, the weight and the value of making a more, of, of a feature, of making something more significant was going to be way more, and I would be basically getting way more out of my education by doing something bigger because... Whereas there are tens of thousands of shorts being submitted to every major festival, there are only hundreds of features. Mm -hmm. And if you make a good one, which I thought that I had the ability to, it was going to be way more valuable and a way more valid use of my time. So I made this feature as part of DePaul's um, program. And the kind of older concept was that you, you make a film and you submit it to a festival and then hopefully it screens. And if it does screen, you go and then... A guy walks up and he goes, wow, that's a great film. Here's a bunch of money to make your next one. You know, I think it's a little bit of an outdated idea. That's like one <clears throat> person per major film festival might get that. Probably, yeah. And that's usually like the best, like one where it's like they would have got money somehow anyway. Like, yeah. Like um, that happened with, I believe it happened with Talk To Me. 
the new mm-hmm. 18 4 film. I think yeah. that happened with those guys. Yeah. Like, uh, people liked it and were like, we want to do another one or another movie with you guys, you know? Yeah. And I, I guess I believe in the spirit that if you are the talent, if you do have the talent, if you do have the um, the unique voice that maybe, you know, you hope to have, um, if you are good, then you kind of can just at least chop it up to you just roll in the dice to hope that you like have what it takes Mm -hmm. and that someone else can recognize it um you're also just rolling the dice as far as festivals go um as far as what they want that year at that time and if people care or not when do you start applying for them is there a certain season they have for applications um it everything's a little different but there are two major festival seasons and that's the spring and the fall um and so in the winter slash spring you have your dances you have your sun dance your slam dance and you also have south by southwest um, and the fall is the much bigger one. That's where you get a lot of your, like, metropolitan area international film festivals, your sh- Chicago International. Um, Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, right. Detroit York. Becca's more in the summer. Um, what but Cannes? Cannes, I think, is a, um, is a, is a spring one. Okay. And Ven- Venice. Venice is fall, right? Yeah. I mean, and we're talking a little bit more above my pay grade as yeah. far as those go. But, um, but like, basically for – you have to submit the opposite season. So yeah. if you're submitting something in the spring, you have to submit it in the fall. Um, so it's kind of a full calendar year process if you want to kind of really Hit explore all, all your options. Is that what you did? That is what I did. Um, so you already I'm submitted still, for the – did you submit for the fall or are you doing that? I submitted for some fall ones. I think um, there is still a few that I'm kind of waiting for them to open up. Um, but I, as far as the spring ones, I did submit to some things. And there are still things I'm waiting to hear from. Um, but it's it's – and I learned a lot because um, some some background context is that um, while at DePaul, I also got to work on a on a movie um, called Waiting for the Light to Change, and this was a DePaul funded feature film as a part of a a project that they were doing called Indie Studio, where basically students um, apply to produce a script, uh, and then you apply people apply to be the director, and then you know it kind of just come together as this big group and have to produce a feature film. Yeah. And this was also um, spring of 2021, so it was still COVID time. So there was kind of this weird production process where there was an idea to do this really big thing, and then it got, you know, too difficult to do because of the COVID precautions, and then they slimmed it down. They rewrote this new script um, that was very small, more like um, classic Chicago indie, kind of mumblecore style film. And um, I had applied to be as the assistant director on this project. And this was like right as I'm getting into DePaul online class. So I didn't even really know anybody. Um, and I got asked to be on the crew as the second assistant director. And it was this cast and crew, five casts, about 14, 15 crew. And we all went to live in this lake house um, on Lake Huron and. Uh, Port Austin, Michigan, which is like a tip of the thumb. Mm-hmm. And we shot this feature film in the space of about a month, living and shooting in this house. Sounds fun. It was a roller coaster. It sounds like it. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty formative experience for me as far as like really getting into the grit of being on a set for a feature film and like for all of us because we're students kind of like stepping into like serious roles and having kind of expectations and responsibilities as creators um, was very, very intense and, you know, definitely was challenging for a lot of us. Um, It was also just because living and working in the same space, like I cooked a lot of food for a lot of people. (laughs) Um, I took out the trash. Like I made, I chopped wood to build fires That's like cool. for real. That's fun. Um, and that film over the course of the following year was edited and um, was accepted into Slam Dance, which if you're not familiar is sort of the DIY punk alternative to Sundance. It takes yeah. place at the same time. Yeah. Um, and it won the Grand Jury Narrative Prize. Oh, nice. So the top prize that you can receive. And then it has gone on this crazy run um, and has gotten a lot of recognition, which is really cool. Um, 
Esquire magazine named it number 64 best movie of the year. It's crazy. <laughs> 64. <laughs> number 64 of their list of the top 65 movies of the year. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's uh, cool, though, that you were a part of it. It's good for your reel and your yeah. CV and stuff. Yeah, and that taught me a lot. And so I actually worked, you know, um, my good friend Jake Rocker, who was the producer on that, uh, one of the producers on that, uh, produced local band with me. And... Um, and uh, so he was uh, in a. Since that film had won the award at Slam Dance, he was um, allowed to be a programmer for their shorts category. And I learned a lot about the film festival process from the other end. Like what? Um, Do tell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> on, so, for example, um, one thing that we're taught in school is like how you need to submit as many supplemental supplemental materials as possible, give people context, let them know, like, where are your films coming from? Who are you? What, why are you telling the story and all that? And he's like, well, really, the programmers, at least for that particular festival, are seeing a link. And then they give you a score out of 10, and it gets passed on or it doesn't. Um, so they don't even look at it? They they do. You watch, they, you're supposed to watch them. And, and there are, like, again, hundreds of, to thousands of, of films and how do they do that how do they keep track of all this time-based media that's like <clears throat> long it's like uh, a lot there's a you know this a dozen or more programmers and they all like they they are incentivized to watch as many as possible but they don't have to watch everything and then it's kind of like preliminary round where like again you rate it out of a 10 if it's a five it probably is not going on or whatever and it's wow. kind of it's a really so, intense process so what do you do to like make it pop without if them I knew. seeing it. <laughs> if like, I knew. Well, like, how would you know? There's so many movie covers you wouldn't know it was a good movie until you watched it. Yeah. Well, and then it, he, you know, he also told me, like, some there are some films that were, like, th- that were kind of going on, that went on to the final rounds and were kind of, like, left off because they were too good. You know, it was like, this is not the place, this is not the venue for this film. It's surely going to get into one of the bigger festivals. Or if it's, uh. like, or if it's just, like, certain festivals, like, curate themes for mm-hmm. their for for every year um and that could be against you if if the theme is tragic stories of indigenous people and then you submit something that's local band like it just doesn't fit in right and yeah. so like there are so many elements against you um in some ways that are just kind of like you know you kind of you you start by finding the festivals that are catering to a, your demographic or whatever kind of story you're telling what kind of what format it's in for example for me i'm looking at stuff that specifically supports like underground films diy films films that relate to music so you have to start there and then even from there it's just you know a gamble yeah and it's been a kind of stressful (laughs) yeah you know kind of process because you, you really start to question like everything about like did i do this right is it is it valid or not and like i know in the end it's like we premiered this movie in September at Beat Kitchen, and it was an absolute miracle how people turned out and yeah. showed their love. And and I guess overall, f- just for that, the movie is a success. Mm-hmm. I mean, people cared about it, and people enjoyed it, and people wanted to see it to begin with. That's, like, amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, even if even if this movie showed at Sundance, you'd get a bunch of people that were just like, well, yeah, you know, cool. Yeah. You, you'd get the me's of the world yeah, going, yeah. picking at it, like, <laughs> yeah. you know. And so, like, I guess ultimately, like, it did what it was supposed to do, which is that it brought the community together and yeah. people cared about it. That's cool. Yeah, so... There will never be another screening as as good as that. So, well, but what about you know, when it comes out screening though? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll try and organize that. You know, yeah. um, you should hit up the music box or something. I did for the premiere, oh, and yeah? the rentals were extremely expensive. I've looked into what are they? Um, so they said for the small theater, which I imagine is the Garden, um, it was like topped out at seventy seats or something, and it was like seven hundred bucks. Um, but for the big theater, it was like we're talking about five thousand dollars or something. Um, and the thing was that I was like, I'm not confident that we're going to have less than 70 people attend. And in fact, we had it on oh, like 175 people show up. So yeah. it was like, good thing we didn't yeah. go that route. But it's like, oh, of course, we weren't going to fill the entire regular music box theater, but it was still like $5,000 is too much to ask. Hmm. Um, so don't you have to have it screen in X amount of screens? 
available to the public to be so it can apply to the award seasons, like so, like Grammys or Oscars. Or... Yeah, that wasn't really in my okay, you know, playbook. It like this is an indie movie and should be recognized and treated as such. I mm-hmm. guess you know, I I kind of understand with the the things I'm playing with, and and reality is like again, like I said, if the goal is to have at least people see it, and then you hope that someone kind of wants to advance your career in whatever way it is, if, even if it's not someone rolling up with a blank check, you know, if you just meet the person who can get you into a room to talk about other projects you want to do, or and then that, you know, just whatever, you know, whatever mm-hmm. it can do for you. Um, and I think that that can happen at indie festivals, even if it's like meeting other filmmakers, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was more the goal. Here. Yeah. It was, it was about getting to places where this kind of art is being respected and right. cared about. So places like Slam Dance were um were places I want to go. That's um, where you applied it. I I did and unfortunately it didn't it didn't make the cut this year. Um, and not Sundance. <laughs> no. Did not apply to Sundance. So, um that's like almost like something they just tell you straight up in school. Don't do that. Really? Why? Yeah. It's thousands and thousands of prestige films from all over the world. <laughs> you know, you're just like, just don't, like be a don't, yeah, come on. And you're, and, you, and these things are expensive too. You know, yeah, it's like uh, if depending on when you submit, can be between fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars to Per to a thing, festival. Yeah. So it's good to get in there early. Yeah, get to get in early so it's cheaper. Yeah, and so that they have more time to watch it and think about it. Supposedly, yeah, those um, judge and jurors and executioners of everyone's exactly. future. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird to be on that panel knowing how much you're like changing people's fate. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Like if it gets ends up getting like the highest award at these, it could they could get millions of dollars in funding from like producers mm-hmm. and stuff. And all. people get people look look at that. Yeah, you know, big producers find out about that. It's well, bizarre. The director of of Waiting for the Light to Change, her career's totally. You know, I wouldn't say like astronomically. You know, rocket strapped, but like this is a great platform to continue doing. You know making movies mm-hmm. and like and that's like the l- least that i wanted you know yeah <laughs> it was like i have ideas and i have scripts i want to do i want to make more <laughs> things you know so that was what i wanted to do it was the goal yeah so um so how they, long did it take you sorry to cut you off no how long did it take you to finish local band um so i wrote the script in summer of 2021 um which was actually kind of based on a that basic idea that i had in st louis that was probably like the end of 2018 so if you want to count that it's even longer but um the production was the following summer like basically doing light development pre-production casting all through the point at which i had finished the script up until production um and production lasted about three weeks and then from then to the screen, like literally the week of the screening was editing. Um, all and, the way up to it. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and I was also in school at the time. And since the whole point of um, of that program was that you had produced your thesis film um, in the summer before your third year. And then throughout the third year, you're kind of going through critiques and showing your classmates and working through post mm-hmm. things. And so I was doing that, um, went through several different like forms of it the first like cut i did was 95 minutes and now it's 77 so it gives you kind of an idea of like where it kind of you know went but um and then i did end up doing all the sound mixing and design myself um which was kind of tough i i did try to reach out to a lot of different people and you know it's just like as far as there's no more money left to spend (laughs) that's a really hard thing that is highly Overestimated and highly misunderstood yeah. is sound design, foley work, mixing, scoring, mastering, the whole, all the things audio is a mysterious place for most people. People yeah. can understand like camera, view, lens, product, like the room looks a certain way, but how to make it sound that way mm-hmm. and how to make everyday textures be more bombastic and like louder and invigorating because that's what sound design is for films. It's not yeah. normal. In a movie, when you're watching it and someone just, like, taps the table, it doesn't sound like a normal tap. It's got some thud to it. It's yeah. got to make you feel this 2D thing needs to be have space and weight to it. Yeah. So it's a hard skill that if you, like, you don't know a lot about it and the technical stuff, it's, like, you know, yeah. as you... It just happens to be the first feature <laughs> film that I've sound designed. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's tricky yeah um, which I did learn a lot just doing it just like throwing myself into it which mm-hmm. I, I mean 
the design for one of like trying to get all of the I I discovered Isotope RX suite and it was like a miracle. I was like, oh my god, I can isolate everyone's dialogue so easily and stuff. And then from there, I just kind of I really like stripped everything back and then tried to build it back up. And yeah, just like having lots of sound, like having you know cars way out in the back if it's in the outside like you know just things far away or like minor ambiance and stuff to just fill the space it's something that as a viewer you never consider that sound is 50 percent of your experience and that mm-hmm. like to keep to keep you mentally engaged and emotionally connected to whatever's happening on the screen you need everything to feel right you need so much of it too yeah. i always say how much more important sound is than anything is Next time you watch a movie, like unplug the sound and yeah. just watch the video. No, no uh, subtitles. Just watch video. Mm-hmm. You'll turn it off shortly or be bored out of your mind, mm-hmm. and then do the opposite. Turn off the video and just listen to it, and it, your brain and body will just paint the whole world for you. You don't even have to see anything. That's why radio works so well. That's why yeah. podcasts work so well. You don't have like radio and podcasts have proven like sound is so important when it comes to telling a story, mm-hmm. painting the world around you. But, I mean, obviously the video part's beautiful and great, too. But sound, it just, it enhances it so much. Totally. You're missing. Yeah, just, like, the room tone or the white noise from, like, a, a highway or a forest in a scene. It sounds so bizarre when that stuff's missing. It feels like you're in a vacuum and it's just missing. When you just have, like, dialogue or music, you know? Mm-hmm. You need so many layers. And the music, the score, has to be timed a very specific way to fit parts that explode or come back or have drama it's really complicated there's yeah. a lot of moving parts to a movie huge totally like you said that one you made with DePaul was 15 people on the production yeah yeah it was like 14 15 you people. all lived in the same house well so we tried to at first and then we had to get another one <laughs> <laughs> um so it was we the cast ended up going into their own place um of five of them and then we kind of tried living as a crew all together and then we realized that was also too difficult it was like we were like six people sleeping in the same bedroom and then like you know as far as like the like uh the plumbing and stuff like for everyone to take a shower or whatever like this was like a this is like a lake house that's used to like three people being Mm -hmm. there and like all pay for all this um so the house was was uh, the producer jake's parents place Mm -hmm. um and then depaul paid for the production so the you know the food and the and the equipment we, the equipment was theirs for the most part um what are your thoughts on college students using the college equipment to make videos music videos albums short films but getting paid by other people to do it and they're using the equipment from the school to make it in that window while there's students there um do you know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Kind of, yeah. So, like, say someone back then, you're still a student, was like, "Hey, I'm gonna hire you, Dan, and your people to come make a music video for us." And you yeah. go, "Okay," and but you take all the equipment from DePaul mm-hmm. to make that video. It's not yours. Well, in DePaul's case, they require it to be relevant to a class. So, what if it wasn't? They will. They don't want they won't let you check out the equipment okay so you'd have to if you lie you yeah you could lie sure (laughs) i'd I'd say go for it (laughs) yeah like uh but because like when i was an undergrad i had a really cool thing where uh what well so the kansas's film school which was relatively much much smaller but um they had their own equipment and stuff but it was again had to be relevant to a class they weren't letting you just take Mm -hmm. things out for your own independent so you're saying go for it i'm saying if you can yeah why not but there's no longevity in that what happens when you graduate and you can't have that equipment, that standard of quality now for your work? Well, in my opinion, <laughs> the education is there. Like, if you're using – like, use the like, resources to to further your craft and your mm-hmm. voice on your own. I mean, like, I would highly encourage people to just get their own camera and make their own movie. I was going to say, it will eventually blow up in your face because you can't – now you set a standard so high. Yeah. Because you're borrowing hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment, you know? And now you graduate and you got nothing. You're like, yeah. well – well, now what? <laughs> that's my case in the sense that it's the people, you know, having people who are film students who are, like, ready to work on sets and stuff. Yeah. But um, but when I was an undergrad, I also, like, I got really into the um, the art school, and they had a particular department called Expanded Media, and they had their own kind of, like, video stuff. And I was hired um, as a student assistant to be the um, 
the cage manager of, of that equipment. So I had access to all this video equipment and I just kept it. I kept some of it at my, my house. So <laughs> I would just have, I just had it free will, you know, mm-hmm. and actually my professor was like very encouraging of, of me like making stuff. Mm-hmm. So he was fine with it. I, I didn't know that it kept like we, I even took, like we had a projector and I just kept it in my apartment and me and my buddy just watched movies on the wall with mm-hmm. the projector all year. But I just having a camera in my house, I was so prolific. We made so much stuff. And like for me, that was the point of school. It wasn't sitting in in a classroom and they're like, so in 1947, uh, Orson Welles, w-, you know, it wasn't like that is one thing. But like the reality is that you're getting your hands on it and doing mm. it for yourself is so much more yeah. invigorating and educational. So – to answer your question, yeah, do it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> just school, be aware you might not have much to show for when you're done. You don't have the equipment. Yeah, but yeah. like, take advantage of it when you have it. Yeah. So I, I, uh, like I said, I directly went against the wishes of DePaul by making a feature film, and I was told in private by certain professors that they appreciated that I was trying to do something um, ambitious, and other professors told me that I was <laughs> that I made a massive mistake. Why? Um because it was a failure because it was not um it was not done by the time DePaul's, you know, program was done. Um there was a, a sound professor who told me, you know, in his office because um by the time we were at the very end of school, I was in we were in this post sound and color class and the sound professor was like, "I am so regretful that you didn't take more care with your sound. This is before I did any sound design or mixing on it, really. Um, and he was like, "You, it's going to take five people and $10,000 to fix this. And, like, the sound may not be perfect as far as my job is done, but, like, what a bullshit thing to say to a student. And also so not true. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, insane. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, they actively kind of, some of them actively kind of campaigned against my making of this thing and so I'm like you know what break break the rules so did you when you were in film school I bet you know like yeah. you have to there's nothing worse than the, the negative like naysayer professor like I definitely yeah. tried to never do that I'll be realistic but I'll more be harsh on like when students will be like oh I want to make this or I want to record this and I'll just be like well go get some gear Yeah, like you have some here you can use but you're eventually going to need and want your own stuff and that's like the harshest I'll be like I'm like, yeah, deliver pizzas for the weekend. Like, shut up. Mm-hmm. Go deliver pizzas for the weekend. Make a couple hundred bucks and go buy your microphone. And then you're good. And then quit the job. And they look at me like I'm crazy. My students <laughs> like, I mean, I will never say, like, you can't do that or that's going to be too hard. Yeah. I would, like, you're going to – they if I had a student in your situation, I'm like, hey, the audio turned out the way it did because of the circumstances. You're just going to have to try really hard with some people to, like, make it. It's going to be possible. Yeah. But just know it's going to take you a while. Yeah, I'd never be like – I wouldn't even bring up money and be like, because you're going to end up figuring out for free with your friends. You're just going to work on it. Yeah. If you have to, which you did, yeah. you're just going to figure it out. You're not going to pay someone 10 grand to do it. Yeah. He could have just <laughs> said, it's going to be challenging, which yeah. it was. Hey, man, this is going to be really hard, but you you got it. You're going to want to start like yesterday yeah. on this And project. I'm like, no shit. It's challenging. <laughs> like, I, like, the whole production was challenging yeah. because that was the point. And like, I just felt like I was resourceful enough to do it mm-hmm. and to pull it off. For example, the movie is predominantly non-actors. If I had tried to pull off this movie with all people who are, like, you know, actors. trained uh, actors or even, you know, God forbid, SAG actors, like, that would have been so hard. It would have been expensive. Im- impossible, expensive. There's only one SAG actor in the movie, and she had a very small role, but she was a friend, and it was like, I wanted to, you know, mm-hmm. include her. So, mm-hmm. but... Um, How'd you get trash? Um, <laughs> just asked. <laughs> that sounds like a trash thing. <laughs> well, he, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's one of those guys that I met very early on in that, uh, you know, when I started going to shows and finding that community, and I just, like... I knew instantly that, you know, he's this Johnny Rotten of a man that he, like, <laughs> is so funny. He's obnoxious. And uh, I was like, he's perfect for this role. Like, yeah. I I was like, it's just this ridiculous over-the-top guy. and um, Which he is. Which he just is. And, uh, yeah, so it was just like, this makes so much sense. And, That's funny. I met him and Super Kick and OK Cool. All in 2021, they played yeah. DZ Fest, and I met like a ton of bands that year that 
I saw in in your movie, you know, it's kind of funny. Small world. Yeah. I've seen those. I think I've seen those videos. Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's, it's so funny. I, I'd like to believe that, um, and I'm, you know, such a, uh, Chicago beginner as it were, but like, I'd like to believe that there are some, this is sort of a generational shift that maybe happened post pandemic to where there's going to be some, like, there's so many great bands that are, that are here and Mm -hmm. things that were kind of propelled out of that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd like to think that that sounds like, you know, one of those examples yeah. of a stepping stone. Kind I of mean, thing. there was it. It's been good and really bad. Being in, uh, being in the thick of it, the center of it for so long. The pan- we still haven't recovered from yeah. the pandemic. Um, the amount of bands that were playing, the amount of bands that had money for records, man, of bands who had money to do live video sessions or wanted to do them in general. It, I at a peak, I was doing like two to four every week. Mm-hmm. Two to four live video sessions every week. And there's been bouts where I can do maybe one or two in a month. Like, it's gone down that much. And yeah. it's been years since since the issue. It, people are out and about, like, working and making money. But, it's like, the amount of money people have, mm-hmm. kind of what they start to put, um, like, what they think is worth doing, that's changed to priorities. So, yeah, I mean... In some ways, it's gotten stronger. In other ways, it's gotten weaker. And by weaker, I don't mean in a negative way. I mean, like, financially. Yeah. The amount of people make as much, it shows. They aren't putting as much vinyl out because of that. Um, it's harder to tour now. Mm. People's standards of living have changed. I mean, everything has changed. It's yeah. weird. It's a weird place. But Chicago is one of the best cities I've ever been to in the world for music because of the geographical place in America. It's great. Oh, yeah. And uh, its own physical geographical size and layout is yeah. great for transversing. If you like, you were from the north side, and how long did it take you to get here? It's a little under an hour, and but that wasn't even like it didn't. I mean, it doesn't even feel like an hour. Yeah, you know, just, I was able to just take the red line. You know, so it was oh, super that's easy. why I yeah. thought you drove. Never mind. No, no, no. I was saying yeah. you said that. I was like, wait, it took you that long to drive no, no, here no. at one thirty? But no, no, I was no, gonna no, say it's about twenty minutes to drive here if you take Lakeshore <laughs> Drive down from there. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm so, so like. To the point of, though, as someone who doesn't own a car in Chicago, yeah, like, and to have been able to access, it's all not that bad, stuff. yeah. And I'm right off the place. red line. Yeah, I mean, it's like a seven minute walk from yeah. the red line. You know, so and that was like I saw that and I was like, Whew, yeah, I'm so glad this isn't a car neighborhood that I, yeah. I can't get no, to. No, it's <laughs> bus. It's great for bus, bike, highway, and and um, train this yeah. neighborhood because of the Sox Park. So like, yeah, everything that was made for that. Now, if you live near it, you get to reap the benefits of public transportation. Yeah. But yeah. but as far as Chicago, like you said, the layout, and I think I've heard you talk about this on your show previously, which is something I believe very strongly, which is like it's particularly amazing because it's like there's access to art, artistic things and people is so much better than it is it's in abundant. anywhere else. It's so abundant. It's everywhere. There's many, many pockets of people like layered on each other. They're right next to each other. They don't even know. Like, oh, I've been hanging out with these, these people in that band. Like, oh, you know somebody? Yeah. I'll meet somebody and I'll talk to them. Find out we know the same fifty people. Mm-hmm. I've we've known of each other for a decade and never met, just because of how many layers of art, band, food, dance, and what brings what's like the fuel for all of our the education establishments. I mean, everyone, yeah. you're an example of it. Yeah. Everyone came here for college, something in the arts. Boom, you live in the same neighborhoods before you know it. I mean, what the Art Institute, Columbia, Northwestern University, Chicago, DePaul, UIC. And a handful of other schools bring in every year. I mean, mm-hmm. tens of thousands of fresh, like, 18- to 19-year-old creative minds just come in every year. Totally. So it's great for that. I mean, it feeds it. And not every state has that, and and not every city has that. And then, um, yeah, our, our great highway system, and everyone just comes in from the Midwest mm-hmm. right here, like everyone. Yeah. Big airports for touring acts. I have no problem asking a touring act to come here. They just... Right off 994. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great spot for that. And it, because it doesn't have that heated competition of the New York, L.A. mindset, mm-hmm. it still has them. It's a legit massive city that has it, but it's just not as aggressive. Yeah, you know? I, I realized it a lot when I, I visited L.A. for a, a music festival um, two years ago, which was like to get to – any part of the city, like to get to Pasadena or to get wherever, it's like a 20, 30 minute drive or whatever. And it kind of, 
it it hurts your ambition to go to those places a little bit because those communities must be very separate. I mean, I think, you know, baseball shirt band is probably of the kings of one of those neighborhoods, <laughs> you know, but like I, I but like do, how how often are they interacting with the other bands in the way it's that probably we a lot are harder and it's probably a lot harder. Yeah. And so I don't know. I think that it's it's also just so sprawled out and so so mm-hmm. disparate that I just can't imagine it being as close. It's a different kind of city. It's yeah. for the music industry people. Yeah. Like New York is, like Nashville is, but as far as community cuz New York and LA have it. I mean, I've been to New York many times to work with bands. They have an insanely cool music community mm-hmm. and it's huge, but that's the problem. It's so big and the land is so big and it's so populated to get anywhere it's a lot more challenging it's just yeah. not as a uh, cruiser and and commuting friendly it's not as um friendly for like if i want if you're from one neighborhood and want to go like where i live if yeah. i wanted to go up to by you and go to like the aragon to see a show yeah if i drive which i would for that it'd be so easy mm-hmm. if the show's at nine i would literally just leave here at like 8 15 get there at like 8 50 park walk in boom back in certain neighborhoods, and that's like seven miles away. In yeah. other parts of LA, New York, but seven miles away, you might be like, I might have to plan for hours to mm. do this. Will I find parking? I don't think so. The list goes on. Yeah. So it's a little bit more challenging. And then the mentality behind it, because the skill set goes up in those cities sometimes because it bring it draws in so many good bands around the world. Yeah. But then the competition is so high or the supply yeah. and demand is different when you everyone's trying to like make it because they're living in a city where it costs four thousand dollars for you know your rent, like New York can for certain places. It's like who in the world can afford to do this, you mm-hmm. know? And you get different types of artists because of it. you get artists who have really good, well-paying bands who like went to college or well-paying jobs, so they can do it during the day, so they can play shows at night. Whereas in Chicago, you'll get a lot of bus boys, uh, bartenders, um, you know, service workers, because they can afford to do that play their shows in the evening and have yeah. rent and then well i'm a bartender exactly yeah. <laughs> and it's really hard in a city like new york to just be a bartender you might have to be a bartender at the nicest place yeah. to afford your your rent um because it's so expensive mm-hmm. or you just might have more roommates you know but it's a little bit more feasible in chicago the rent's just not as bad yeah although where you live the rent the rent's a little bit more than it is down here up and up town. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have roommates or just? I don't. Um, but I. It is. It. It's a um, cost-effective apartment. I'll oh say. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, a one bedroom too. Yeah, it's a one bedroom, and um, I I do okay with my job. Um, yeah. And work full time and everything. So yeah. it's um. And I also I I I am a teaching assistant for a class at Northwestern. Oh, nice. Um, which is a it's a video storytelling class. That's cool. Yeah. So that just like a little extra. Thing. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome though. Yeah. At least you got your foot in that world, you know. Yeah, I think right now the most realistic ambition is is teaching, which I actually have I've really enjoyed. Yeah, and it's extremely rewarding. So you definitely could do it. I yeah. mean, since you have an MFA, you could try to get some type of terminal job, you know, mm-hmm. somewhere. Because I mean, that's that's what I had from the art institute an MFA. So that's why I've been able to teach full time. And yeah, no, it's changed my life. I mean, very risky. I think since you got one, you could agree with my my rules of the MFA because I've been asked a lot by a lot of people and students. Yeah, should I go do it? And I said, there's only three reasons to get an MFA. But I'm only talking about MFAs for those who don't know. Those are Masters of Fine Arts, and it is a terminal degree for your respected field. Whereas normally in research and academia, you have to get a PhD, which is your terminal degree. But if you go into the fine arts, it's MFA. A lot of people do not know this. Yeah, they literally don't. So I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself. But I've had a lot of students, people ask, like, oh, I want to go to the Art Institute or DePaul or, or you know, Northwestern or U, U of C for MFA. And I go, MFA is the riskiest graduate degree to get by mm-hmm. far. <laughs> and you, you now know, know this. <laughs> and the reason I say there's three reasons you should get one. One is you're really rich and you're bored. Okay. That's one. Not many people I know. Yeah. Number two, uh, you have really good connections some nepotism, some, an aunt, an uncle, a parent, someone's like, just get that. It's a Dutton McCallie and we will hook you up on the other end. Yeah. That happens to students. They're just told, just get through school and then we'll like hook you up. Uncle Leo's got, you know, uh, a job for you once you finish. Okay. That's the second one. Wasn't me. Doesn't sound like it was you. No. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, like I said, it was more about doubling down and taking another swing. Right. And the know? third one is falling towards that. The third one is you are so driven, passionate, obsessed, actually good at. You've been told by people you're good at this thing. You're not, you're not, no uh, uh, delusions of grandeur going mm-hmm. on. And you'd want nothing more than to do that in your life. There's nothing else you can do. Like you are, you are going to do this if it takes your, your death. You'll, mm-hmm. you'll do it. And that's why I was because I did not have money or connections and I took a massive risk going to the most expensive MFA program in the world at the Art Institute of Chicago. <laughs> and it, and it, it, it worked out. It worked out. Yeah. yeah. But it was risky and I was very driven and I worked a lot while there. And I was doing – everything I do now is doing that in grad school. And um, that's the only reason why I worked and I got lucky. I got a full-time teaching job right when I graduated, which is crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. To get with one. It was but it was it was risky. It was super risky. Mm-hmm. I would not recommend it for anyone, really. To spend that much time and money on like a degree that unless you have a connection your foot's in that door, you're doing it is completely useless, like in the workforce. Unless you are a very specific world. Yeah. You know, like teaching or the arts, or you have a connection in Hollywood or Atlanta or New York City, you know, and you go there. Yeah, I figured that when I graduated undergrad that I could at least that I could apply that to um, more corporate interests because video is so key in mm-hmm. in so many things, and um, it just turned out that I was I would be miserable doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, but you could, yeah, could. you would be miserable doing it. Yeah, and so that's that's another factor in that. Yeah, uh, but I I I think regardless, moving to Chicago was probably the best decision I ever made. So it sounds of, like it. Yeah. it. Sounds like I mean you've been doing. Nothing but productive things in just three, three and a half years. Yeah, totally. Which is awesome. Mm-hmm. And have you made other longer form video projects? I've, I made some, some feature films in, uh, like I said, when I had that camera in my apartment that I had kept from school or whatever. Me and my roommate, again, most prolific era of my life, um, had made um, some, some longer form projects. Mm. Um, nothing worth anyone see <laughs> but uh, but very important to my 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 artistic growth uh and then uh when i was living in st louis again i i got kind of re-energized f- from that and was like yeah let's try it again and, and made some more stuff then but as far as having been in chicago i i made a couple shorts and a couple music videos and and uh and then local band i think mm. i i I've always appreciated a DIY approach, especially to filmmaking, because it is something that is kind of taken for granted is mm-hmm. storytelling. And kind of when we were talking about, um, like you said, um, turn a movie's visuals off and just listen to the sound, mm-hmm. I firmly believe that the video quality, you know, like the Mumblecore kind of films kind of like embodied this, which was you can tell an amazing story and it can be on a DV tape camera or, you know, an iPhone or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, if the audio is great, it's like, to- it's like, you know, no big deal. There's no barrier of mm-hmm. vi- like for visuals. I think at least for, for me, I, I don't care. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to look like Roger Deakins shot. It can be, <laughs> it can be on a tape, yeah. you know, I love that. Um, if the storytelling is good, you know. So I suppose that DIY filmmaking is kind of, what really, really inspires me, especially because it's so hard and it's always seemed like such a monumental impossibility to ever consider that I might be the person who's directing Marvel movies or something. Like the barrier of that entry is insane. Again, mm-hmm. like nepotism, rich, whatever is probably the most likely. Or you you go to LA and you really hobnob or really work super hard at networking or whatever there. And I'm never been interested in that. And I just don't think those things apply to me. So I think I kind of also through maybe the YouTube influence or whatever, I just like, we can make amazing feature films for no money with non-actors, with shitty cameras and tell great stories if it's, if you have it in you. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, that is sort of my ultimate philosophy. Hmm. And I thought local band was, was a way for me to really take a huge swing at it because we spent, you know, $12,000, which in the grand scheme of filmmaking is, you know, very small, even though it's an insane amount of money just to me as a person. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but um, non-act, and that was mostly food. 
just I don't know if people realize this, but food is the most like expensive thing outside of gear. Oh yeah, yeah. The amount of money I've spent on food and water and beer for my friends, my volunteers, my interns, the bands, people helping set up for the fest specifically. Yeah. I mean, it's insane how, I mean, if thousands of dollars. Yeah. I've just, out of my of my own money on beer, because people are, like, volunteering and helping out. I'm just mm-hmm. always buying pizza and snack. Like, yeah. yeah, no, it's it's a lot, so I completely understand. So, yeah, s- low-budget, non-actors, student crew who, you know, are not being paid. It, my, uh, my DP, we used his cameras, his personal cameras, um, all borrowed locations, People that were just willing to let us in, like, hookups, like Chris, H- hookups and hookups. Yeah, and it's like that's all that can happen. That can exist, and you can tell great stories with just hookups, elbow grease. Yeah, <laughs> like you can do it, and like I, I love that, and I think that that is still a possibility, and I'm like very thankful that that's the thing that I've become interested in. I agree with you. I can still you. do it. <laughs> I agree with everything you said. I appreciate that about you, yeah. actually. It's hard to find people that have that strict of an ethos, that strong of a constitution in the DIY way of doing things and the DIY way, DIY rather, DIY, DIY way, that's funny, <laughs> DIY mentality and DIY of doing things. Because, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, and I'm yeah. right there with you. There is one issue though it's how long can you do that for before you need to pay your taxes and a mortgage and babies on the coming up and your car broke down like i'm assuming you're you're 28 with no kids i'm assuming yes yeah yeah i'm 34 with no kids that's why i'm still doing it's a tuesday and i'm talking to you in the afternoon yeah not in an office somewhere Mm -hmm. i am at my office so yeah it's at a certain point, it's why DIY um, houses and DIY crews and DIY workshops, why they don't last too long. Yeah. Eventually, people got to make money. People have to have insurance and have a house and have a college fund and pay off their student loans. People get burnt out and exhausted uh, over it. So what do you do? Like, Because I 100% agree and appreciate yeah. that mentality and perspective. I live it too. But I've ran into now the part of my life where it's like you can't live like that you can live like that live like that forever you just got to be willing to be on your own and not expect all the people to do it with you yeah because they won't that is because <laughs> they have real bills and they just won't they won't yeah. be like wait we're we're doing this thing again it's going to take 40 hours and i'm not getting paid yeah yeah my wife's gonna kill me like yeah. not happening you know no that so what do you do that good question <laughs> <laughs> you're um, like i haven't gotten there no yet. <laughs> yeah it's it is kind of what you're saying about like after you leave school then you lose those resources and 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 also yeah just getting older losing resources mm-hmm. like being in the service industry is uh and having a flexible schedule for that um sometimes um has allowed me to a be a musician and do all the other creative things um but you know of course it does just take other people and you have to have other people who really care and so that is kind of like the main the main notch that makes it difficult, I think, the most the most difficult part um, is finding somebody else to help you do it. Um, but otherwise, it's like as far as like time and stuff goes, is like yeah, until my friends start having children, um, it's like theoretically, we could take a Saturday, and we could shoot a whole short film on a Saturday. Absolutely, as long as the like the. Uh, ideas there or whatever music video music video you know um you said three weeks it took you to make local band to shoot to like shoot it physically like to physically shoot it three weeks i mean if you do a saturday and sunday three weeks is 21 days that's 10 and a half weeks and you're done if you just had like say you had to work monday through friday and you could only film on weekends yeah in in two and a half months you got yourself a movie you know that's kind of what we did when i was living in st louis i made a feature film um with my friend nick and we mostly just shot like every tuesday and sunday we'd get together and Mm -hmm. we would just like shoot another scene Mm -hmm. um it ultimately like it only took a couple months and then the pandemic happened and we couldn't shoot the very last scene (laughs) um which was a bummer (laughs) um but uh Things like that, that experience uh, or the experience of working on Waiting for the Light to Change or shooting that movie in that house, like still like as hard as it is, it's just so alluring. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just I, 
I want to be doing that. It's the most, Isn't it fun? It's the most fun, the most fun. thing Being you can possibly have. Being in the thick of it, have. the mud of it, the dirt, the grime, like what you experienced there, yeah. sharing the bathroom with everyone, everyone making food, sharing blankets, mm-hmm. su- suffering. When you suffer with your peers, especially when you have the same goal in mind and you know yeah. each other, that suffering bonds you in a way I cannot explain to people. It's what makes best friends so close and parents so close. You suffer together. And I felt that for 10 years with my festival, I feel that now even with the documentary that we're working on about it and even the sessions, just how many bands I had to film and record to now just be able to like meet new ones or have them reach out to me and want to come here and take off work to come here. Even that, it's like totally worth it. The little tiny things like that make it worth it because it was—it's just an idea originally, yeah. And all of a sudden now you get to do it, you know. And it's probably felt with the DePaul movie, the fact yeah. you got got some love and, and respect, you know. And you're like all that crazy stuff you guys had to do, yeah. And like, I, it's the first thing I would teach in a film class of my design is that is what? it's hard and it's awesome because it's hard. Yeah, it wouldn't. It's probably gonna suck if it's not hard. Yeah. Like it's it's. I I work I have worked with people in film circles who seem to think that everything has to be super easy, like to, that everything has to be like really really well thought out and there and like that that is for the most part very important but um but like that everything has to be perfect and that things shouldn't be going wrong ever and I totally disagree. It's like things will when go wrong. When has that ever happened? Like when things, has anything been perfect and well, things didn't go wrong? <laughs> I think when people go like for certain film students they go into school thinking like the, you know you're the way that you imagine film making and sets is that like oh there's a very nice schedule for every day and that everything goes as it should and the AD is on top of it and it's like Everyone's going home at the right time, and the unions have you know protected us against it being too long and too hard, and and like on big movies on Avatar, I'm sure that that is how it goes. You know, when there's a billion dollars going into it, and I just felt like some people didn't kind of understand at times working on indie sets that it's none of that not stuff's there. Going to happen? No, it is indie for that reason. It's DIY for that reason because we are only 15 people or we are only, you mm-hmm. know, 10 people with no money. Mm-hmm. Like it may have to be PB and J's today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it may, we may have to push the schedule a little bit because, um, super guys are late mm-hmm. today <laughs> or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I'm calling them out cause they know what they did. Um, the super, super kick guys. They're yeah. late. Yeah. I'm just, <laughs> they know I can rip up them about it forever. Um, they're, <laughs> um, but you know, just like, and things just, they don't always go correct. And yeah. I think if they if it's not happening like that sometimes, then yeah, it's like I just don't know if it like it just feels more genuine to me. I don't know. I don't I don't know if that all made sense, but it's just like it's just gonna be hard and because it's hard it's fun and because it's hard it's worth it. Mm-hmm. And it's so much more rewarding mm-hmm. when it does work yeah. at the end. And the only way to make it work is to do it. You can't give up on it, you yeah. can't get mad at it, you can't re- be resentful. Plan out the project and do it. Use all your resources. That means your friend down the street has a mic. You have a camera. Someone else has some lights. Mm-hmm. And someone else has a free space. Sounds like the four of you should get together and make a movie or a music video or oh, a TV so show or a, a podcast. You know, you got a microphone, a camera, and a space? That is a blessing. Yeah. I, like, I would die for that right now. Yeah. Like, you th- can do so much with just a microphone, a camera, and space. I mean, yeah. I've, I've been doing it for so long, and it, it's changed my life. And it's such a simple concept. Yeah. Just... Who are you capturing? It's all about what you're putting within those mediums, within that transducer of a microphone. Like, that's it. It's the talent and the people behind it. But you just need some gear. Nothing crazy. If some decent audio on a decent camera with a stabilizer, mm-hmm. it goes, it, it's way worse than things have been made. Like the old Jackass or CKY. Oh, I love CKY. You know, or, or Trailer Park Boys. Like, yeah. you know, the way the, these shows and movies are made, they're low budget, not mm-hmm. well made, but because the content's great and it's remotely digestible, usually the audio is really important. If you can have good audio and okay camera, mm-hmm. like a Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity, yeah. that'll be way better than good camera, terrible audio. Like blown out, distorted sound on like a beautiful 4K red will be yeah. not enjoyable. Yeah. You know? So focus on your audio. Yeah. Doing a PSA announcement. Yeah, right of now. course. You know, yeah. focus on your audio. Yeah, the film programmer, <laughs> if you have a 4K thing shot on an RE camera and the audio is terrible, you will be 
passed over so quickly. Yes. Yes, but yeah. if you have, you know, even now with iPhones and, and Samsung, like the phones we have now with the stabilizer and good audio, you will be able to make nice feature length films. It's yeah. Crazy. Never thought I'd th- like that would ever happen. Yeah. You know? It's funny you brought up Blair Witch. That is such a great example of it. Where it's like you could have just ran around in circles in the woods yeah. and like with a camera with no lights. Yeah. Like it's like that. And that or Tangerine by Sean Baker. Totally. Sean Baker's Great. amazing. Yeah. Just iPhone 5. Everyone go check out this movie. It may be on Netflix. Yeah. iPhone 5. Mm-hmm. But with some good lighting and a stabilizer and really good audio, the audio, real boom, shock mic, real good audio, it made that into a bigger film, which got him uh, Academy Award nominations for the Florida Project, his yep. next film, which never would have happened if Tangerine didn't take off. Exactly. So you'd be amazed what you can do. With next to nothing, I mean, yeah, one cheap mic and your iPhone with a stabilizer, you can make a, f- a movie now. Totally, yeah. You know? I would live and die by that. So. Little like uh, our young versions of ourselves would not. I couldn't comprehend that. Like I was born in eighty nine. If I think of like ninety six, being like seven, like the big VHS cameras I used to use, or I guess the the mini VHS ones, you know. Yeah, yeah they were so bad. The quality and you. We I made plenty of home videos. That my first film, the battle that killed us all, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was a war film. It was inspired by Ghost Recon, the Tom Clancy game. Ghost sure. Recon, yeah, yeah, for PlayStation Two. And yeah, it was terrible. I couldn't do any like post production editing. Had to wing it all. Our set design was great though. It was an old. <laughs> it was my forts in my backyard. I made into like a paintball fortress. So we just used that yeah. for like this army film. It was great. I love that. Yeah, it was good. The title, The Battle That Killed Us All, is so good. <laughs> Even if it was just a shot of a bunch of people laying uh, down. It was so bad. And we made a mistake that a lot of Hollywood big films make with, like, guns. We had paintball guns that we uh-huh. were using as our weapons. And one of them, I was supposed to unscrew the CO2 so it didn't shoot any of the air out. Because even the CO2, yeah. just like a blank from a gun, is harmful. If you mm-hmm. put it up to someone's head, the CO2, it's going to hurt. Yeah. And sure enough, there was still CO2 in it, and my brother was holding it at like, my friend's, like, face, and they were, like, fake fighting. He shot it, and, like, the air just came out of her. We just cut the camera. Oh, <laughs> he ended up being God. okay. He ended up being fine. But it was it was sketchy. Like, if he was six inches closer, he could have, like, took his eye out or something. Oh, no. you know? That's crazy. Yeah. Don't be careful with DIY films. Yeah, I had yeah, the cops called on me when I was making a YouTube video with my friends <laughs> um, because we had some Nerf guns and a school bus rolled by and they called the cops on us. They thought of real guns. Yeah. Wow. They, they, they just let you go. They didn't bother yeah, you. Yeah, they came over and they told my parents that we were being uh, ragamuffins or whatever. Mm-hmm. They were like, you, we thought these were real guns. And they're like, okay, yeah. And they police had nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, (laughs) yeah. So it was dumb. But again, filmmaking is hard. (laughs) Yeah, it is. I had a guy set on fire in my backyard for this music video that was being made. Oh, shit. My my old property where the fest happened was used for like a lot. Yeah. A lot of non. I have had so many music videos filmed there because it was big open land and a garage and a basement, a studio and the four. So like there's plenty of space and we already did whatever we wanted. So it was a free for all for anyone who wanted to make something. And this band, Black Bear Rodeo, friends of mine, uh, we recorded a record or an EP there, and they wanted to. I think we recorded it there, and they wanted to make a music video. I was like, sure. And they make this music video, and a guy. They actually had a crew come up from like Atlanta, and I got professional. Um, stuntman who's used to being set on fire and professional mm-hmm. like pyrotechnic guy they put the goo on him they lit him on fire in my backyard I'm eating pizza recording <laughs> an album with a different band while they're using my backyard this other band to make a music video this guy's running around my yard on fire and I just like this is what life am I living I'm just <laughs> like making an album with one band watching another band use my yard as a music video place setting someone on fire it was awesome. Yeah. It was like the coolest thing ever. I still have footage of it. I still can't believe that happened. Like that I don't know anyone who could ever say that's ever happened on their private property. Did that video come out? And it, yeah, it did. I could nice. send it to you. And it's not even like people could probably say it, but they were probably had something to do with the video. I had nothing to do with it. They were just using my land mm-hmm. and my space and my cabin and like all these cool things I had. But I like hadn't it wasn't like I was a part of it. It was just maybe I'm credited <laughs> as like I guess 
in that situation. You know, in the film world, producers and executive producers get thrown around left and right. Yeah. Co-producer, associate producer, associate co It's like, what? Yeah. What are all these people actually doing? <laughs> yeah, they're like, hmm. Looks, looks good. Looks Here's good. another hundred grand. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It must be weird to be that kind of person for a film, but not any of the creative part. But your yeah. name is all over the film just because you gave money, you know? That's got to be a Yeah, feeling. that's like Steven Spielberg's main gambit right now. He loves that. Yeah. Him him, and, um, who's another big person that did that? Uh, what's his name? Not Steven Spielberg. It's like closest friend. Um, George Lucas. Yeah. Steven Spielberg. Oh, I'm, th- I'm glad that he hasn't done it a lot, but James Cameron's done it a couple times. Not too bad. Michael oh, Bay had the Oh, my Platinum God. Dunes. Don't even get yeah. me started on Michael Bay. <laughs> Michael Bay is, he is, like, when I watch something bad, I'm like, oh, does Michael Bay make this? Like, <laughs> like obnoxious action to the, like, highest degree. And I'm just like, this is, this is like a Michael Bay film, even yeah. when it's not, you know. He, I watched, like, a video about the way that he directs camera movement um with this like sort of parallax effect where he'll have something moving in the background and it's going one direction and then the camera's kind of move, rotating around a character and they're moving in another direction I've in the way that you that. can kind of like create this insane you just described armageddon yeah <laughs> like that's what it feels like it's when set you to an aerosmith movie. song yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, what a terrible movie i mean it's <laughs> a great movie but it's terrible <laughs> like I'm sure if you were born now and watched it, you'd be like, why did my parents like this movie? Yeah. But when you were born when I was, it was like, that's a cool movie. Bruce Willis, Ben Affleck, who else? Liv Tyler, Steve uh, Buscemi, Ed Owen Harris. Wilson, Ed Harris, I think it's Apollo 11. Oh. Or Apollo 13. Hmm. Oh, that's what Tom wait, Hanks. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I'm thinking of, there's a guy who's in it. Billy Bob Thornton. Billy Bob, yeah. I'm like naming everyone. Is <laughs> is Vig Rames in it? No, I don't know. There's a bunch of people in that movie. Yeah, it's a bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we it's almost been two hours. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. That's so, crazy. anything you want to promote or put out there before we end? Um, yeah. Keep an eye out for for local band. The if you want to keep it like in touch with the with updates and things on that. Uh, at local band the movie on Instagram. Yeah, he's talking about a movie, by the way. Because yeah. if you're in Chicago on this podcast, so like, you say yeah, like, local keep band. an eye out for a local band. And they'd be like, there's a ton of them. Which one are you talking? Yeah, about? keep an eye so out on film. Local band the movie. Local band the movie. Yeah, um, on Instagram, and uh, yeah, my band's called Damager. Damager C H I on Instagram. What do you uh, play in Damager? Um, I'm the vocalist and I play guitar. Nice. Yeah. I'll have to get you guys in here sometime. Yeah, we'd love to. That'd be, so, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, those, are the, those are the things, mostly. Uh, and musicians when, what, Movie Club. Sorry, say it again? Yeah, Musicians Movie Club, the podcast. Me and right. Tom, Tommy Kessler. Dang. Yeah. I'd love to go on that sometime, too. Talk Please do. Movies. Yeah, we got to do it. Let's talk some shop. Yeah. So session movies, and then... You have no plan for like another screener in Chicago of your of the local band movie? Not not at the moment. <clears throat> like I was telling you, I think before we started, um, just that it's it with the festival circuit process. Um, festivals do not want to screen films that are already publicly distributed. Uh, ah, yes, to, that's true. To yeah. save their, um, you know, some exclusivity, so that people actually buy tickets and show up. Absolutely. Um, so that's the unfortunate, um, you know state yeah. of things but uh but yeah uh just keep an eye out and you know i chicago has not seen the last <laughs> of local band being screened so i hope not yeah. i would like to see it like screened yeah somewhere. maybe even if you can't get it in a theater or something a me- mid-sized venue you we know? have we know enough people we'll figure out i was gonna say between to some it. projectors and us and some speakers you could probably just do a really cool one at like a space somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, like a flex space or a, um, someone's DIY venue or something. You know? Yeah, exactly. So. Cool, awesome. Well, thank you. Right, it's yeah. nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, real quick, uh, quick question. Real question. <laughs> How did you find out about this? I mean, you reached out a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, well, actually, going way back again to my St. Louis days, the first. I I had seen a session done here by the band The Mercines. Yeah. Um, and that was, um, my friend Nick knew, um, Kaz from yeah. the Mercedes yeah, yeah. and sent me their Small stuff world. and yeah. And then, um, yeah, just through my friends, um, Molly Compton, Trash, and then yeah. Mark Derry did a session here. Yeah. Um. Small world. Yeah. 
That's cool. So it was like, and then I noticed you had this podcast. And I was like, oh, yeah. hell yeah. I love that. I don't know if I know any bands from St. Louis. I know of one band that was going to play DZ Fest, Shady Bug. I believe oh. it's Shady Bug. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Any, I know so many bands. And that's the one city I'm like, do I know anyone from St. Louis? Yeah. I can't think. Well, there's a. I would it, like to. I just don't know any. Yeah. There's a lot of St. Louis transplants here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Molly's one. Um, yeah. Yeah. My friend Tommy. Um, Logan, who's the drummer in Pink Squeeze. Um, mm, okay. Yeah. So this this city is mostly transplants. Yeah. I'm I'm one of the very few people that have like grown up within this place and all around it. You know, not a lot of people have, which I I like. Yeah. You know, my roommates from Seattle, Spokane, like Washington. Oh, you cool. Know? Also went to DePaul for his master's. Small world. Hmm. Look at that. Hmm. Cool. Well, anything else you want to promote or no, say? That's it. That's it. <laughs> well, that's it. Are you sure? I think we're almost at two minutes or two hours. Well, that that's good enough, Dan. Check out Blair Witch Project. <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen it. <laughs> if you haven't seen it. Check out Dan's work, uh, local band on all social media. Uh, local his, band The Movie is the oh, whole Oh, that's a official title? The title of the movie is Local Band, but to... So, so that it's not just at local band. It's local band, the movie. Okay, local Instagram, band, yeah. the movie. Good. Mm-hmm. Check out local band, the movie. Keep an eye open for when it comes out. Yeah, or right? for any screening stuff or any, screening any stuff. Do you have an, an Instagram for that or anything? Yeah, Instagram is at local band, the movie. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Dan. Yes. Appreciate it. It was very nice to meet you and yeah. talk with you and look forward to when we do that again. Hopefully, yes, sir. sooner rather than later, we should get uh, the band linked up with this. Maybe we do a podcast again. And then, yeah, if the movie ever does come out, it'd be fun to have you come back on here again. Totally. And I'll have you yeah. and Trash come on, and we'll just get oh, ridiculous. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> he moved to Montana or something. So, oh, yeah. Uh, Move to yeah. Montana. <laughs> so he might be hard to track down. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dan. This was really fun. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Ciao, everyone. Bye.